It's now my pleasure um, to introduce uh, the moderator of our first panel, where, when we will also welcome back uh, Commissioner Cañete and Mr. Pershing. Uh, but the, and the panel uh, on the climate policy in the post-COP21 era will be moderated by Andrew Steer, who is president and CEO of World Resources Institute. And for those of us who live here in Washington, he is a very well uh, known figure, and also in, a, in the worldwide wide debate, he has been um, very active. So, um, Dr. Steer um, joined uh, the World Resources Institute from the World uh, Bank, where he served as a special envoy for climate. And before that, he was the Director General at the UK Department of International Def Development in London. Mr. Steer, please come on up and introduce the panel. Good. Well, I, I, would, uh, I would simply like to ask the four panelists to come up here and sit with me. Uh, we've had uh, uh, three really magnificent uh, speeches, well, four, including the ambassadors, um, which framed beautifully uh, what we're going to talk about now. Um, uh, Minister Dijksma said, it's time now to take the bull by the horns. And that's what we want to do now in this, uh, in this conversation. Um, uh, Co Commissioner Cagnetti said, it's time to accelerate. It is time, uh, we're in a marathon, not a sprint. It's time to take difficult decisions. And that in a way captures this sort of cognitive dissidence we're all in at the moment. We, we, we feel understandably great satisfaction and joy at a historic agreement and we should be patting ourselves on the back for this amazing thing. And people in this room, and especially some of you up here on the stage, deserve enormous credit for that. But at the same time, we now know it's not enough. We need to do more. We need to implement. So that's what we're going to, we're going to uh, talk about now. Uh, I'm going to ask a, a few questions to our panelists. And the idea is it's totally conversational, no, no speeches or anything. And then we're going to open it uh, to you. Um, I'd like to start with the two that we haven't heard from so far. Um, Andrea Guerrero Garcia is director in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Colombia, responsible for overseeing economic and environmental and social issues. Uh, Colombia is one of those countries that, um, that actually uh, uh, seems to be taking things very, very seriously. President Santos himself has been heavily engaged in the process. Um, and, and our understanding is you guys all went home to Colombia. You got sort of a whole of government approach. You got ministers engaged. And you seem to be sort of taking this very seriously. Just tell us where you are right now, because I think that would frame it, because quite frankly, not all countries are doing that. Those who are up here on the stage are, of course, otherwise they wouldn't be here. But actually, uh, around the world, not, not everybody, not every country is taking things as seriously. So, so I think the kind of thing you're doing, you've got something to teach us, Andre. Just tell us a little bit about it. <clears throat> Thank you very much, and, and thank you for the invitation. I feel the responsibility as, as being, um, I think, the only panelist from developing countries to say there's a lot happening in our countries. There's a lot being done. Um, in Colombia, yes, we are taking things very seriously. We've been working for, um, I would say, uh, more than a little bit more than 10 years on, on getting our game ready for transforming the country to get ready for climate change impacts that we can't avoid and do our part to lead um, in, in action, uh, in, in mitigation. The country has three main strategies that, that we've designed uh, in terms of climate change. The Colombian Low Carbon Development Strategy, our National Adaptation Plan, and our um, National Red uh, Strategy as well. The Colombian Low Carbon Development Strategy started right after Cancun, where we got this uh, international signal of, of action needed from all fronts and not only from developed countries. And uh, of course, we know we can't contribute as much as, as larger countries or countries that, that have larger emissions, but we, we felt that the country can do something and can align action uh, <coughs> that makes sense with our objectives, with our economic and, and social development objectives. So we put that uh, instruction to the productive sectors into our national development plan. There's a mandate in there that, that tells them to start working on mitigation action plans by sector. And we have the first round of those already done. 
And when we came back from Paris uh, with our commitment of 20% deviation from BAU for 2030, we then started the task of dividing that into the sectorial um, ministries and into the productive sectors. We, we did that last month, and we have now the division set. Uh, and then we're com coming into the adjustment of the mitigation plans, so everybody knows what they have to do by when, and we can uh, deliver on our commitment. And, and we do take it as, as a commitment that we took with the world in, in Paris. In adaptation, the country's been suffering impacts already. Uh, so I think that's, that's in, in every citizen, in every Colombian's mind, uh, climate change is a reality. Uh, so for us, it's very strange to hear about climate skeptics because we have the opposite problem in Colombia. Everything's climate change fault. But um, we do see, we, you know, it, it, if there's an earthquake, they think it's climate change sometimes. But <laughs> we, we have that opposite factor because we, we see people very worried with water scarcity and in other times of the year with uh, intense flooding and all these impacts that are, are affecting our, our poorest uh, people and our poorest communities and our productive sector as well. So our adaptation plan uh, is doing uh, a huge effort in integrating adaptation and, and reducing vulnerability in sectorial planning and in local government plans. And, and we're advancing pretty quickly at that. And finally, the National Red Strategy has very ambitious goals. We have a goal of zero net deforestation in the Amazon region, uh, which is a very large chunk of the country by 2020. And we have other uh, very aggressive goals also in the rest of the country. And uh, we're moving quite fast in these. And I, I have to say, in all these, uh, all three of these areas, we've received a lot of support and a lot of uh, help from, from other ambitious countries that are not only doing things at home, but really supporting action abroad. And I have to say, the European Union and the US have been two of those key partners for us that have worked in, in forwarding this agenda. Great. Thank you very much indeed. We'll come back to you with some more questions a little bit later. I'd like to turn to uh, Bob uh, Pochiseppi, who is the president of the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, which is one of the most uh, effective uh, groups here in, in, in Washington. Uh, before that, he was acting director, uh, acting head of the EPA and had a, a very distinguished career in the U.S. Um, administration over many years and knows probably more about sort of the uh, regulatory and legal issues um, in this country than, than, than anybody uh, alive. Um, Bob, um, uh, Bob, as people sort of th that don't know much about the United States, they, they sort of tend to look at things and say, wait a minute, those guys up there on the hill aren't incredibly helpful to you right now. Um, and, and also the Supreme Court isn't exactly <coughs> sort of where it needs to be on some of these issues. And yet you are still smiling. Um, and, 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 and are reasonably optimistic about these, uh, these quite ambitious targets of 26 to 28% by 2025. Why? <clears throat> well, first of all, um, I'm just, we're sort of dealing with Jonathan's second bucket here, you know, <laughs> the, the nationally determined contributions. And I thought that was great, Jonathan, that those buckets that we all have to deal with. So I, I want to make sure I'm in context of the overall issues here. But in the United States, um, Many things have been going on for quite some time, and our actual trajectory overall on greenhouse gases continues to trend downward. Um, but in 2003, the president put out a climate action plan, which is pretty much the roadmap and blueprint that, that, ha that the administration has been following. Um, and there are a number of very key components to this, and we sometimes get hung up on one particular component of it in the regulation of greenhouse gases from the power sector. But in advance of that, there was also regulations on the fuel efficiency of the surface transportation systems in the United States, both trucks and cars, on a trajectory to cut the emissions of those in half by 2025. And that is underway. Nobody sued. Or if they did, those are all long gone. And it's in the process of being implemented. So there's some foundational stuff that's underway that already gives you some confidence. And in terms of the clean power plan and the reductions of emissions in the power sector, the emissions in the power sector have been going down already without uh, a regulation. Uh, Congress, uh, maybe, maybe inadvertently, uh, but I think knowingly, uh, helped uh, accelerate that by additional tax credits for renewable energy uh, uh, creation. And, Jonathan mentioned his conversations in New York where 
more financing is now going to, to renewables than, than, than fossil fuels. So that process is underway, but let just very, very briefly on the, on the, uh, the issue of the Supreme Court and, and the regulations themselves that aim to get a 30% or 32% reduction by 2025 from the, 2030, I'm sorry, from the power sector, and the Supreme Court has already ruled on these authorities in the past. So this is not a new thing for the Supreme Court. And in 2011, the Supreme Court unanimously agreed that EPA had the authority to regulate greenhouse gases from power plants in a case called Connecticut versus AEP, and that was unanimous. Um, and that Section 111D, the current section that they're using, was the vehicle to do that. So this litigation is a lot more about how they go about exercising that authority rather than if they can rec uh, exercise that authority. And so that may continue for some time, but in the meantime, I think it's really important to note, and at the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, we spend a lot of time talking to the power sector companies and also to the states who have to put the plans together, virtually all of them are working on this plan in one way or another. They may not be writing a plan, as some of their <coughs> legislatures said they cannot do, but they are meeting and discussing how they would go about doing it. And that's setting an investment pattern already inside most of the power industry in the United States that is in that same trajectory. And then we've already mentioned HFCs uh, and the authority that uh, the EPA has under the uh, Clean Air Act to regulate uh, under, under a program there and, and the participation in the international discussions. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, the President and, the, and, the, uh, and Canada announced a joint effort on methane uh, emissions uh, using some of the same uh, regulatory authority. So these processes are underway, and I think that they are, are very encouraging when you look at the overall trajectory. Now, one quick thing, uh, Andrew, is that is that most analysis, including analysis that we've done at the center, uh, show that um, there's still a gap to reach our nationally determined contribution. And I think the State Department's report to the UN in December also demonstrated that there's a, a gap there. And so there are many things going on to actually deal with that gap. New policies being uh, uh, reviewed. Um, when you look at the work that's going on at the local level, which I think uh, Jonathan also mentioned uh, in terms of uh, the cities and what they're doing to look at energy efficiency, um, we have a lot, and we had 150 businesses sign up to American Businesses um, uh, Act on Climate Change. They represent seven trillion dollars in capitalization. They're all making commitments themselves. So you've got uh, a lot of momentum, including on technology, like batteries, that is going to keep this trajectory going. That's why I'm still you know, pretty confident that, uh, I think after all, it's nine years from now. Think back nine years yeah. ago and Great. what we didn't know and, and are now doing. Thank you, Bob. I told you he knew a lot. Um, <laughs> Possible that not everybody understood every single thing you referred to, such it's as Section 111 D. But, but if questions. you'd like, a, 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 you know, an explanation of Section 111 D for the Clean Air Act, Bob will be glad to give it to you afterwards. <laughs> that, that was, which is exceedingly important, by the way. Um, and thank you very much. That was that was really terrific, um, Commissioner Canetti. Um, uh, you you uh, you gave a, a wonderful statement of sort of where you are, and also sort of you hinted at some of the difficulties. Um, uh, you, you have a difficult job uh, because you have this very ambitious 40% goal by 2030. As you said, no one else has uh, a, an absolute goal quite like that. You now have to um, reach agreement with all 28 countries as to exactly what their role is going to be and then also a number of other things you have to agree with them. They're not all saints. Um, not everyone is uh, a member of the Sierra Club. Um, uh, some, uh, you know, fear that, uh, that this will actually undermine uh, some of their economic goals. Do you want highly confidentially to tell us um, uh, sort of just how difficult it is and how you're going about trying to get them all in the same place? <clears throat> well, we cannot talk with presidential decisions. It's very pretty clear of the European <laughs> Union. We have 29 parliaments, the European Parliament and 28 national parliaments. And we have to establish not only a, 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 an ambitious global target, our target is not only 40, it's at least 40%. It's domestic action without using international credits. It's a nationwide um, across all the sectors commitment. So uh, 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 we have a very ambitious global target. 
But the problem is we have to establish 28 different national targets in the sector which is not, not covered by emission trading system because for the 11,000 industrial establishment, we have a carbon market and emission trading system. We, it, already the legislation is in the parliament. Um, uh, we're discussing uh, in that because all the sectors want to be given free allowances. It's quite difficult, but we have to prevent carbon leakage. It's, it's our companies uh, going abroad because of the competition from foreign companies that don't have carbon taxes, carbon market, it's an ongoing debate, but we will keep on developing our carbon market. For the industrial sector, things are pretty clear. There is a big political discussion, but we will solve it. For the sectors not covered by, by the emission trading system, that's to say agriculture, transport, and buildings, then we have to establish 28 different national targets, and that is the difficult exercise. Mm -hmm. And that is an exercise which is conditioned the ratification process, because no single country wants to engage in a ratification process without knowing what are the efforts they have to, de to deal in the different sectors. And without having a national debate, because it's pretty clear, and, and, and Jonathan pointed very clearly in his speech, that um, m most ministers who were present in Paris were environment minister or climate minister. They were not transport minister, they were not agriculture minister, they were not finance minister, they were not in energy minister, they were not um, uh, urban planning minister. So, so now, many of our countries have to, to launch a stakeholders debate to give support to the national targets they have to implement because we have a record uh, in the European Union, a track record of being serious. When we commit to a target, we fulfill our targets. So that debate will take long uh, in the 28 different parliaments. It will be, we want it to be fast track, but this has to be an important debate. There are countries who will come along very early with the ratification. But other countries will have a very internal, complex situation because when you have to make efforts in agriculture, when you have to send all your transport modalities, eh, and, and when you just have to, to buildings which are very old, 80 percent are inefficient, you have to refurbish them at, at, at bigger rates. That generates an, a national debate, and, 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 and that is for sure. Mainly because also we are going to frame uh, our efforts in, 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 in a mid-century strategy. The, some United States, Canada are already working one. We already have a roadmap of the carbonization of our economy, which is a target of 80, between 80 and 95% in 2050. But in view of the COP agreement, we'll have to review those, those elements and we, we, we will pre start pre the preparation of, of a nationwide study in the year 2018 after we know um, the results of the IPCC um, a study, but they will take into account uh, what means the 1.5 in terms of pathways. So we will also de uh, deliver on that. But it's real that we had a, a hard work. But what I can say is that in the past, in, under the Kyoto Protocol, we had a target of reduction of emission of, of, of 20%. Uh, since 1990 to 2014, uh, we, have, we have reduced our emissions by 24%. But at the time, uh, our GMP has increased 50%. So we are fulfilling our Kyoto Protocol agreements, but we are decoupling economic growth for reducing emissions. So it's, it's possible to reduce emissions, have economic growth, and that's very clear from the figure. What we want now is to deliver on our ambitious at least 40% target, implementing the whole legislation. All the legislation of the European Union will be in place, launched in 2018. The Parliament will discuss uh, along 2000, uh, this year, 17 and 18. And uh, by the year 2018, all our legislation for the next 10 years, regardless of the changes of government in the 28 member states, will be in place. Because that's the beauty of having European legislation. You have a, a, a compulsory a binding framework which applies in the 28 countries, regardless of the, of, the, of the changes in politics in the 28. These are long-term targets with long-term policies and forces uh, without the constraints of the elections having new governments who change the policies. Mm -hmm. Because that's a, when you are speaking about climate change, you cannot play a short-term politics. You have to have policies for the whole of the century, consistent, steady and ambitious. Mm. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, we will be opening the floor, so if you want to follow up on any of these questions, um, please do. Jonathan Pershing, um, uh, your three buckets. Uh, the first one, sort of globally, what do we have to agree. Second, we've got to implement our, our own INDCs. And third, we need to think of sort of the long term. Um, Bob talked about the second. And just staying in that second bucket for a moment, um, a, 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 as Bob said, and you, you said yourself, I mean, the United States to get to the 26 to 28 percent, I mean, it's uh, some of the measures are sort of in place now, but not all. 
Could you just talk us through a little bit about the measures that will need to be taken in the coming few years? And if you want to link that to sort of some of the political challenges, that would be interesting as well. Thanks very much, Andrew. Uh, I, I think that Bob's laid it out pretty nicely in terms of a number of the pieces. But let me walk through a couple of the elements that are there and perhaps elaborate slightly on a few of them. So we clearly have a, a variety of different sectors in which we're engaged. Right? If you think about the US emissions pie, about a third is uh, power, about a third is transportation, about a third is other. And into other falls industrial emissions, but also land use and agriculture. And about 85% of emissions are carbon dioxide, and the remainder are the other gases. About 85% of emissions are energy-related, which includes transportation, uh, the power sector, and the rest is, uh, is the other activities. So our emphasis is going to therefore be allocated in those domains. Some things we think we can do pretty efficiently with global collaboration. And the commissioner mentioned and the minister mentioned the issue of the Montreal Protocol. If that were to move forward this year, that would make a difference in terms of some of the growth rates that we've got. It's not one that's highlighted all that often, but collectively, should the world move in that direction? We've estimated you could reduce almost half a degree of warming over what would have otherwise happened. That is something that's enshrined in the existing U.S. structure when the protocol and its amendment goes into force, the United States can move forward. There are other things that are underway in the land use sector. So there's a lot of work being done by Tom Vilsack, who's the U.S. Department of Agriculture Secretary. He and his team have been actively looking at a variety of tasks that are now looked at at a very local level. He's got his Soil Conservation Service aggressively working in every district to think about how you can change practice, how you can change structures to increase the amount of carbon sequestered in the soils and change the agricultural practice. In the same vein, we're looking quite aggressively at our long-term ability to maintain our carbon sink in the forest sector. That structure often also not given the same kind of attention, but we believe that while it's a declining sink, it will, it will level off, and we could maintain an ongoing capacity to sequester carbon out of the atmosphere. Let me turn now to the two big ones. One, of course, is the power sector, and one is going to be the transport discussion. On the power sector side, there are a number of both immediate and longer-term dimensions that we should be looking at. Bob noted what was going on with the Clean Power Plan. Our sense also is that there's a very robust uh, case in favor of its movement. I would note that historically, he mentioned the fact that the Supreme Court has given us not only the authority, but the mandate to move in this domain. But I'd also note that in prior circumstances where the court has chosen to intervene, the final outcome is a very minor change in the final agreement. The legislation, the regulation changes only at the margins. And we have, in fact, seen some test cases like this. It's happened in Mercury. It's happened in other parts of the Clean Air Act, in which the Supreme Court has said, you actually didn't get it quite right. We think there's some interpretive difference here. Go back and do that piece again. The overarching view holds. The structure holds. But minor changes in implementation strategy occur. That gives us a big move towards the 26 to 28 that we need. But Bob also mentioned, and I tried to allude to some of the work that's going on at the state level, and I would look at the states that are moving beyond the power plan in terms of what they're doing, at the activities that are underway in terms of new investment that will exceed those that are required and what those are doing and how those would generate additional activity. And on the transportation side, Bob also noted we have this requirement to get to, in the United States terms, not the European model of liters, but in the United States model of gallons, getting to the equivalent of 54 miles per gallon. But there is a review of that legislation in which we may have a chance to augment it. And that will happen, of course, after our administration, but that's the thing we can put into motion during this year and think about how that plays out and get additional reductions from that sector. I would take note in some of the dynamics of the, of the automobile sector of the announcement made last week when Tesla re released its first figures and now has 400,000 vehicles on order for a car that's a fully electric vehicle. So if we can combine that kind of trend with our power sector trends of decarbonization, you see real potential for reductions. But the states are moving beyond that. The states have got renewable standards. The states have got efficiency standards. Individual cities are looking at building codes. So in some sense, the commissioner, with his 28 members, is mirrored by our own 50 members working on some of the same dynamics, but moving equally to his model in individual ways, and we need to be supporting them. So it's not done. I think the trajectory is the right direction. I think it's taking us down the right pathway. It is going to be in every sector, every aspect of that work, that we'll have to move it forward. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Andrea, uh, Colombia has been a leader in the sort of international space. Uh, you still are. Um, you are highly respected. As you now approach COP22 in Marrakesh, um, 
what are you looking for from the international community and what kinds of discussion are you having um, internationally? <coughs> Well, we, we haven't had the first sessions, uh, official negotiation, negotiation sessions after Paris yet, but I can tell you it's going to be a challenge because on the one hand we have to maintain momentum and, and maintain those signals that we sent in Paris to the private sector and to countries and to local governments for them to keep moving forward, but we also need to realize that there's been a shift. As Jonathan said, we, we're done with the, the politics negotiation and now we're into negotiating how we're going to set up the rules and the mechanisms that are going to help us get there. And we have this um, mentality or this tradition in these negotiations of every year delivering something. And it has to be big and the host country normally puts a, its name on it. So it's the, you know, Marrakesh, whatever mechanism or, or other. And we have all these tasks that we need to do. If you look at, at, at the table that the Secretariat from the UNFCCC prepared, I think it's like four pages long of things that we have to negotiate and set the rules for or set the mechanism or say how things are going to work. And one, one of the, the examples that is most important for Colombia, and I know that um, other delegations here as well, is the global stock take, for example. We said that we would do it. It's critical. It's a, it's a crucial part of the Paris Agreement and the post-Paris scheme, but we have no idea how we're going to do that, what information is going to be part of it, and we have to negotiate that from now on. That's not done in a year, unfortunately. We're not very fast in this process. Um, so it's very tricky to maintain high ambition and, and, and keep the world moving while we work on these things and at the same time not try to deviate into trying to negotiate um, an intermediate outcome of some sort just to put a title on it or just to have something to deliver uh, every mm -hmm. November or December. So I think that's going to be our challenge. Uh, and also I think that the Lima and Paris, uh, the, the two cops before this, helped us a lot in making civil society and, and private actors part of us, our, our discussions. And I think we need to rely on them also to help us keep that momentum and showcase things every year instead of expecting the negotiators to un unveil some new thing every year because we're going to take a little bit longer to develop these things in, in most cases. So that balance is going to be tricky. Um, also, <coughs> some are thinking about a work program. Uh, our delegation's view is that the work program is a Paris Agreement. We do not need to set a new program. Um, but the way we implement it, the way we negotiate it is not set. So that, that organizing ourselves into this new mode of work, I think, is going to take a little bit of discussions and, and coordination uh, amongst 196 countries, which is not easy. Um, but we'll get on track, and then I think we, we, we will slowly get into that shift of mentality in building what has been set out and not trying to set new things every year. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. So many questions I'd like to ask, but I, I want to jump to um, the issue of the price on carbon, if I may, to um, co the Commissioner. Um, uh, Europe obviously led the way on, on a, you know, creating a price on carbon. Every, every economist believes that's perhaps the single most important uh, policy that's out there. Um, Europe has developed the most sophisticated system, and yet, obviously, the price on carbon is not enough in the ETS to generate the kind of change. Um, and so, at the moment, as you know, there is uh, a global price on carbon club, if you like. Um, uh, Minister Senegal Royale and the CEO of uh, DSM, uh, Faike uh, Siebsma, are, are, are leading that and trying to sort of ramp that up. For Europe, Commissioner, I mean, you're obviously thinking about sort of uh, how do you revamp uh, the trading system. Could you share with us your current thinking? Well, we, we, we had a carbon market. We were the first one to, do, to, to deliver one. Um, it has had some problems, for sure. We corrected the, the problem we have uh, by establishing a, a market stability reserve it's not yet on, in action, but the Parliament has agreed the way it will take in allowances and bring allowances to the market to have a, uh, avoid big peaks, but uh, being steady the prices. And now we have made a reform in which we have uh, increased the annual uh, cap reduction. We have gone from uh, 
uh, 1.74 to 2.10 or something like that uh, along, uh, along the period, so there will be less allowance in the market, the prices will rise eventually, and the companies can make their own predictions in the future. We have chosen a carbon market as a market, not fixing prices, carbon prices administratively. We prefer a market that works, we will correct uh, the things that don't function, and, and what we are happy is that China is going in the same direction. It's, it's, it's enormously important that China is going to develop a nationwide carbon market. We are cooperating with China uh, to see how those markets are developed and in the future interlink. Uh, Switzerland has another carbon market, so in the United States there are um, other carbon markets developing. So some of us have gone for the carbon market. Other people want carbon taxes or, or, or border adjustments. The, feeling, the Commission thinks that going to a, to a border carbon tax and, and to try to calculate the amount of, of, of carbon of industrial products in other countries, that will lead to very big problems on the WTO uh, in principle. And, 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 and then we establish with political administrative fixing of different targets all over the world with very slim, not a level playing field. So our approach is well for carbon market. We will continue. Uh, there are some member states who, in addition, establish carbon taxes, but the European framework is developed a, nation, a, a, a European Union-wide carbon market, correct the problems <coughs> in the past. The, the, the proposal is now in the Parliament. The, the amendments uh, will come uh, very soon. There is a big debate uh, because all we have assisted to protect those um, industrial sector we are most exposed uh, to international trade and competition we, and, and, and they are given the best performers they are given for free uh, more allowances the worst performers get less allowances so it's, it's, a, it's a carbon market who should send signals for the purpose of the carbon market the, the carbon market is to point that we are going to develop a renewables and a clean energy society and the signals must be given to industry fairly in advance it's real that the price today is low but if you see the reform we have made our impact assessment shows it will be higher in the future. Um, but we want a market. Mm -hmm. We don't want uh, some uh, wise people deciding any day what is the cap. There are people who want a corridor. They want to have auctions, but with a cap and a ceiling. Well, it will be very complicated to establish that. So we respect fully the positions of the national governments, but from a European level, we will deliver a carbon market we will make sure we have full cooperation with other carbon markets that I will develop in the future. We will try to interlink those markets and going for a global carbon market in the future with, with common pricing, which is the best way to have a level playing field. And is there a price that would make you feel that, uh, that actually behavior is starting to change? responsible for climate and energy, I will never <laughs> say which is the price I envisage. I will never try to influence the auctions, and okay. I will for once in my life be prudent in my statement. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Okay, let's open the floor. Would anyone like to ask a question <coughs> back there, sir? <coughs> and if you keep your questions fairly brief. <coughs> my name's Thomas Grindley. In the climate change discussions, nothing is ever said about the effect of the world's population. I suppose that the rate of climate change is directly proportional to this. Is there an optimum population? Thank you very much. Uh, we'll take a few more down here. <clears throat> take, we'll take the two here. Thank you for very interesting interventions and a very good panel. Sandrine Dixon de Clare from Sustainable Energy for All. And so I'd like to turn your attention a little bit more to the access question. Because as we're looking obviously at innovation and science predominantly in the developed world in terms of moving forward, I think we need to understand the importance of access and I'll be talking about that. Can I get some reflections from those of you on the panel in terms of how best to decouple emissions, <clears throat> sorry, from growth, and how we can solve this very deep access problem of 1.2 billion people who actually don't have access to energy. Thank you. Thank you, Sandrine. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, Nick Maybe from, from E3G. I just wanted to, again, thinking about after Paris, it's a, it's a bit of a new world. We have this hybrid top-down, bottom-up treaty. But we didn't finish the job, and we all know we need to get 
do a lot more in 2020 and 2025 to get nearer to well below two and strive for 1.5. That's our goal. Just wanted to get a reflection. I mean, we're expecting a lot of countries to over deliver their NDCs. China's already said it will do. Europe will do. What do we expect to do in 2020? Will people put forward, are people expected to get that ambition on the table, to get the over delivery we're seeing from new technologies? Are we expecting people to put forward um, new NDCs? The US will have to put forward something obviously going forward a bit further. So how does that play out? How does our 2020 play out um, going forward? Because a lot of people coming out of Paris still feel, you know, it's still a promise and we've got to start making it real for them and how we're going to increase that ambition and show we're actually going to meet our goals. Terrific. Thank you very much. We'll take these, well, we'll take one more here. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, thank you. My name is Ana Palacio and uh, I will mention a past incarnation. I was a member of the executive committee of Arriva and I think that Paris has achieved many goals, but one very important as uh, Commissioner Cañete portfolio uh, just reflects and your, your center is it reflects as well is that uh, energy policies and climate change policies are not clashing any longer. But there is the N word. What about nuclear? What about nuclear for this long term? What's the role? Uh, uh, Mr. Cañete and Mr. Pershing both have highlighted that we need a long term policy. Uh, what's the role there for nuclear? Good. So, a question on population, two questions on energy, and one question on how do we ramp up in enthusiasm and ambition? Who wants to take population one? Well, uh, nobody wants okay, it. I, I can do it. I can do it. Uh, first of all, it's clear that the, one of the factors we know for sure is that the population will grow. That will create pressures in every sector. There will be an increase in demand of energy, for sure, but mainly there will be an increase of demand for food. And probably the tensions created by the increase of population with the scarce water resources will see to see how we feed increasing population. On the field of energy, if we are going to a transition to clean energy, we will have to have more clean energy. But we, the, the, the numbers of population will not be, not be dramatic. Eh? Because if, if we develop performing renewables, if we increase our energy efficiency in, in the future, if renewables are much more competitive <coughs> than fossil fuels, the increase of population will be tackled with renewables. Because we are, we are thinking in the actual population going in 2050 mainly to generate 100% of our electricity with renewables. We will have to have more renewables to fit more population. So I don't, on the other side, on agriculture, on food, with limited land resources and limited water supply, that's a challenge uh, for innovation, for water management, and, and, and for it's a cause of major concern. The FAO is, is having, having lots of reflections on, on, this, on, on this big problem. And, and, and you see, one of the investments you see in the world, you see some countries which are buying land to produce food in the future, big amounts of land in the future. Others are buying commodities for energy eh, on other side. So the, the people on the long term are, are, are thinking one of the, of, of the things is food. Um, just coming back to nuclear, we in the European Union, we have an article, which is Article 194 of the treaty, who establish each member state can decide their energy mix. They have, we have the targets of emission. <coughs> Within those targets is one have an energy mix. If they go for nuclear, the Commission will assure the, the maximum levels of safety and security. That's, that's my task. But nuclear is a fact within the European Union. At the moment, there are many countries which have announced that they will have more plants. The United Kingdom eh, is announcing a substantial increase in nuclear power. We have Finland at the moment currently going. We have France. We have Hungary and some other eastern countries. So nuclear is a fact within the European Union. It's a fact in the United States. And we have uh, important technology. We have developed very good nuclear technology. The Japanese have developed it. The Americans have technologies. Uh, the Russians and the Chinese. This is a, a global market with competition in the nuclear sector. We are uh, in, 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 the, in the, the energy mix. Member states decide the energy mix. But regardless of the energy they have designed, they have to uh, fulfill the climate change targets. So mm -hmm. it's a challenge for all of them. Good. Anything else on the um, Sandrine's question on access and energy or, or uh, 
On the energy gap, if, if, if I may, I think um, in Colombia at least we have um, we have a se sections of, of the population that don't have energy and they're not connected to the grid and um, unfortunately it's, it's the poorest of our country that are in this situation. And we're finding that with renewables um, we have a solution that, that targets both problems uh, and, and is, is really becoming a a beacon of hope for these populations because connecting them to the grid was so expensive and, and would have taken so much um, infrastructure that now we're finding that these, these alternative solutions that now the prices are coming down every day more are becoming, becoming real solutions for them. Uh, whereas right now they're just using diesel and they have the highest price, prices of, of uh, gas or, or, or fuel in the country. We're finding that now with the, the prices going down of renewables, we're, we're doing a leapfrogging, I think they call it here, into uh, renewable energies, and it's really becoming a, a viable solution for, for these populations. So I think that's, um, that's an unintended uh, but very welcome uh, resource for, for people in, in those remote areas. Good. Both. So um, the ambition question was also embedded, I think, in, in these. And, and one, of the, one of the, I think, elegant components of the Paris Agreement is this ability to increase ambition over time. It is a durable framework in that regard. Uh, but probably, and I, I don't have an answer to say how this will happen, except if, as I said earlier, if you go back four years ago and say, what could our ambition be four years ago with the innovations Andrea was talking about and others have obviously observed, we might have had a different view. And I think four years from now, we will have a different view once again on what we can do and what is being done. The agreement created a framework for that to be captured. And I think the promise of that, which is still to be honed in, is that increased ambition as we learn and do better on technology and, and implementation uh, is the path to achieve some of those two degrees and even yeah. below two degree uh, goals. So we, that is uh, probably one of the most important, and I think, uh, Andre, you brought it up in terms of how, what, what is the stock taking and how is that going to work? This could be a critical component of implementation. Thank you. Um, Jonathan, uh, Nick Maybe's question about sort of uh, we went to Paris, we agreed actually it'd be a lot less than two degrees, significantly under two degrees. Basically, the INDCs are not going to get us anywhere close to two degrees, let alone one and a half. But inspire us as to what could happen in the next four years so that we get to a position by 2019 where we'd be able to say, my goodness me, we really are going to nail this. I, I would say several things about it, and it speaks also to Anna's question around nuclear power. I am struck by the kind of modeling work that's been done. The IPCC records any number of these questions in which we look at a series of scenarios around two degrees. And that's what they did. They have not yet done the 1.5. The commissioner has noted that's a report that will be coming out in a few years. There's more work to be done, obviously, on that segment. But if I look at the structure to get towards the two degree number, which is one of the goals that we've tried is that we want to be below that, but that's at least a, a threshold we'd like not to cross. And I look at the options that, that, that we do and what the models currently suggest, and they say that every single technology will be applied. It's not just renewables. It's a huge amount of efficiency, enormous gains in efficiency. It includes carbon capture and storage, which we haven't really talked about at all. But at the end of the day, the retirement of the existing capital stock is probably not likely to be fast enough to move in that direction. In fact, the models suggest that if you have neither nuclear nor capture and storage, very few models actually solve the problem of getting to two degrees. So there's an open question here about what we have to do. In my mind, you have to do everything. Every single lever that you can pull has to be taken. And I would note that there are a number of ministers who are meeting in a few weeks, uh, actually a number of them here, will be going out to California for the next clean energy ministerial. And on the margins of that, there's also what we're calling mission innovation. It's an exercise in doubling the research budgets of all of our major research programs in clean energy finding those next generations of solutions. And what's promising about it is that we don't actually have to solve the problem in 2020 or in 2025. We have to keep moving it down 3 to 5% per year, an enormous change, but it doesn't have to happen in one year. We don't have to go from 0 to 80 in one year. We have to do it over the next 50 years. And if we are steady and we keep up with that agenda and continue to take the best available technology and apply every single tool at our disposal, 
I think we succeed. I'm quite optimistic, given the kinds of research that we've seen just in the last few years, what happened in Paris was the generation of a new signal, the sense that the market is now on notice. Pay attention, there are profits here, there's a cost to inaction, and governments will be watching and requiring aggressive effort. In that context, this steady drumbeat, I think, will continue and go forward. Great, thank you. Could I just have a follow-up question, uh, Jonathan, and maybe both, both of you could take this. Um, obviously, the short-term goals to 2025 or 2030 need to be seen within the longer-term goals. And there, there's a little bit of um, sort of, uh, the, 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 there is a school of thought that would say in the United States or Europe, um, to get to your 26 to 28, the way we're going to do it is move from coal to gas. And in the meantime, we're going to invest a trillion dollars in gas infrastructure that will still be there 60 years from now when actually we won't be able to afford to have gas, quite frankly, because we won't get to where we need to get to. So I mean, it's very exciting that the U.S. is actually this year is going to come up with a long-term strategy because that would actually precisely address this. Is this a, is this a hot issue? Um, and it's same, same with Europe. I mean, Europe is also investing very heavily in, in a sort of the bridge, which is gas and so on. But we should be very clear. At the moment, what people are looking at is climate is the issue that we are all speaking to here. But if I were to turn off the lights, people would have a different kind of a problem. We have to maintain an energy reliability in the structure. We have to maintain economic development and growth. And for that reason, this kind of long-term vision would help inform that kind of a process. We can't treat climate change in isolation. It's part of an economy. It fun fundamentally fuels everything in our systems, and so it has to be an integrated vision that we create. So what's the economic growth going to look like in the US, in China, in India? How do we manage the 300 million people in India, for example, who don't have access to power? They are assumed to be growing. What will we do for them? How will the translation of our own technology development in the US and in Europe play out in that community? That's going to change the nature of this. And to me, if you don't take this integrated view and just try to solve the problem, you will create other unexpected outcomes that may make it more difficult, not easier, to fix the climate issue. Thank you. Again, I was in the United States in 2014, and I say something that I was, I was crucified, which is Paris will not deliver a tool automatic to be in the two degrees, in the below two degrees. Mm -hmm. it, that will not be in Paris. Paris will adapt the thing. Mm -hmm. And that's why we fought from the European Union and our friends of Cartagena Group, they had ambition to have this dynamic review every five years, because as it was very clear that we, we, we would be unable to establish all the elements to say, we put these policies tomorrow in action, and we are there. No, this is a policy for the whole century. We have along this, this, this century to limit global warming to well below two degrees uh, with a view to 1.5, and pursue efforts towards 1.5. That's why we started with the dynamic <laughs> stock take, with, 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 with the transparency, the accountability, all these elements of periodic review. And that's why we have the mid-century strategies, so that we, these elements of review and the, 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 doing a stock take every five years are in a long-term perspective, 2050 for the beginning, and then it will have to be done for the rest of the century. The European Union will have to make a extremely difficult impact assessment of the of the major changes in our in, uh, social and the impact on, on social sectors and economic sectors, because the change of, of the energy mix, and I am commissioner also for energy, is dramatic. It's a revolution. But in 2030, we will still have gas at bridge fuel because the cleanest fossil fuel. The consumption, the estimated consumption in, in the European Union is 480 BCMs. Mm -hmm. They will be there. What will happen in, in 2050? We will have our decarbonization study, but it points eh, that we will have to be over 95% uh, uh, reduction of greenhouse houses. That brings producing 100% of electricity <coughs> with renewables. That's a different uh, exercise. Okay. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Oh, we would love to. I see Nick is very keen to come in, but you're going to be chairing the next session, so you can come back to this issue. I would like to ask the organizers to guide me at this stage. My, I'm receiving mixed signals. My, my program says we go to 10.45, but at the back there's a flashing light that says we have one minute left. <laughs> Which would you prefer? <laughs> Sorry? Oh, to stop now. Oh, okay. Sorry, I, I have something I was given that said 10.45. So I regret that. We have to uh, bring this um, to an end now. Uh, I thought we had another 15 minutes, but I think we've had an incredibly... Uh, rich uh, discussion. 
Um, I would like to thank the European Union for, um, for, for putting on this kind of thing, actually, for creating such a stimulating um, atmosphere. These are, these are difficult times, quite frankly. And I think I, I really would like to thank our panelists for being you know, really honest as to, as to where we are. And uh, let's continue the discussion over coffee now. Uh, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you.